welcome to the Right Now Show. I'm Judy Saxon. And I'm Charlie Redner. This is the show where we put the emphasis on writers, writing, and the arts. And we're going to talk about art today. Judy, what's your experience with art? Fourth grade, yes. I had to draw a caveman. Okay. And I had so many, I kept erasing and erasing till literally there was almost a hole in the paper and I think it was close to a traumatic experience. <laughs> <laughs> Mine is similar. Have you ever seen these trees where people carve a hundred horses in a row, and you know? Oh! Uh -huh. Well, I had to gouge out a little piece of wood to make a candy dish, and everybody got like balsa wood and just scooped it out. <laughs> Somebody gave me a piece of cherry wood, <laughs> and I almost put a hole in my hand with, you know, gouging out the wood. I never did get my little eighth grade candy dish. Oh. <laughs> That's my art. <laughs> well, we have a wonderful artist with us today, Dawn Malcolm. She was educated as a biology, but she is an illustrator and sculptor by design. And this is a, a, a sentence from a bio about Dawn. She, used, she uses form, imagery, and allegory to conjure up stories of unsuspecting minds and in particular, is particularly interested in the ancient myths that help us make sense and nonsense of the natural world and the human condition. Welcome, Dawn. Oh, thank you Hi, so Dawn. much. Thank you so much for having me on your show. Well, we're, we're, it's our pleasure. Now you 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 became an uh, well a, a working artist, mm -hmm. kind of late in the game. Really late in the game. Yeah. Um, you know, I raised a family, and that was my primary job. And during those years, I was an illustrator and did a little bit of writing mm -hmm. um, because I could do that after the kids were kind of you work at home, and right? Yeah. yeah. They go to bed. I could go and do my work, but it was definitely a backseat profession. Um, but then my youngest went into college in um, 2009 and I spent a few years getting educated in clay arts and mm. in 2014 I started working with clay as a profession. Wow. When you started illustrating, you had no experience or did you? Well, I was a biology major, as Judy mentioned, I was a biology major, but I mm -hmm. always took an art class. I always oh, had an okay. art class in there, okay. so because um, it's a way for me to repair myself. I mean, as I'm studying organic chemistry and <laughs> physics and biology, the art was a place for my, you know, my soul to soar. <laughs> and what mediums yeah. did you like to work? Watercolor or um, Well, acrylics? I really enjoy, yeah, watercolor, and but I always kind of had an illustrator bent because I do in watercolor and then I want that black yeah, line. Right. I like, and I like illustration because it tells a story. And mm. I've always found that when I do a piece of art, I like it to tell a story. Right. Uh, I like a story to come with it. I know you did a cover of a book written by a mutual friend who used to be a yes. member of our writers club right. here. That's Jerry right. Bollinger. Yeah. Yes. And yes. how did you do that? Was that in oil? Was that in No, that was acrylics? actually watercolor. That was watercolor indeed. Yeah, I found it. And well, thank you. Oh, she oh, wanted a yes. haunted house for yeah. the for the cover. <laughs> and um, yes. Isn't that wonderful? It's a good book too. It's oh, I know it's a good book. I read book. it. Wonderful. I did too. The first thing I did was read it so that I could kind of get an idea of what Absolutely. I thought that house right. was going to look like. That almost looked like it's worked in glasswork or something and you yeah. photograph it or something. It's, it's definitely watercolor, but then yeah. also with, with um, India ink kind of filling in and doing the shading. Oh, okay. and, well, right. that is beautiful. Right. You well, had a whole you. career there if you wanted to be a I did that. magazine and an and a, uh, illustrator for books. I it enjoyed that. Now, what about the myths, the interest in myths? Have mm -hmm. you always been Always in? been interested. In fact, yeah. we, um, when I was little, we went to a church called McAllister Presbyterian. And I don't know if you know McAllister College, but it's oh, in sure. St. Paul, Minnesota. Right. Well, this is the church that's right across the parking oh. lot from their fine arts building. Anyway, there was a library there. And after church, a lot of times, mom and dad would want to chat with people. And so I would go into the library and they had um, Dallaire's big book of Greek myths mm. and I just loved it because the illustrations were huge the stories were short enough I could read a couple before it was time to go I think that's where I started you know with the Greek myths and um, I love those stories because they kind of tell a tale that applies to everybody no matter where you're from there's greed there's jealousy mm -hmm. there's love there's you know distraught love there's mm -hmm. always something that kind of resonates with everybody and you weave it in with your work, with your right, artwork. Right, right. Yeah. I like those themes. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I do indeed, thank you. Well, I think we're gonna see some of her work. Well, let's start with number one, because she said she starts out with practical items. Right, so. this is functional work, and uh -huh. um, dog dish, 
in the oh, oh, what yes. more? <laughs> Water or food? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Eat, right. right. Or make it pair. <laughs> right. Dog dish and mug. And um, I enjoy throwing mugs because it's a cylinder and it's the first thing you kind of oh. learn to throw. And actually, mm -hmm. so is the dog dish. They're cylinders. Uh -huh. And um, and then nice doing some illustration oh, along the side. Yes. With oh, I see the little dog? That. Yes. Yeah. That's called scraffito. And it's when you scratch an image into the clay before it's fired. Never knew there was a name for that. Right. And oh. you did a wheel and you learned how to spin. Right. Right. Do you do it by foot? Yeah. I do. Well, yeah. they've got electric wheels yeah, now. I know they do. Oh, so, do they? Yeah, <laughs> you just, once you get it going, <laughs> you can concentrate <laughs> on your pot. But yeah, so that's some functional work and okay. I, I enjoy doing that, working on the wheel. Number two looks kind of functional. It's a blue soda fired vase, right? right? And this is the process I fire with mostly. Um, it's called soda firing and it's a, it's a um, atmospheric firing gas kiln and you, when you get to temperature, when you get up to about 2300 degrees, you have a soda ash in water and you open up the peeps and you spray that in and that soda ash just aerosolizes and covers the pot and it becomes the glaze. Oh my goodness. What so, size kiln did you buy? Is it a uh, Well actually this is at a, I work at a clay center called okay. Northern Clay Center okay. in Minneapolis, Minnesota and it's a fairly large kiln. Um, so you fire everything at, out of your home? You don't have uh, a... Well no, at, at the clay center. At the clay center, And that's yeah. the thing about clay, it's a very communal art because a big soda kiln is an expensive thing, yeah, I was and, and you can't that. have one in your backyard in Minneapolis. I'm sure that there's no way you'd zone for that. Right, but, right. But so you come together as a community, and and um, oh, you know so for the expensive equipment yeah. and whatnot. Yeah, it's a my very neighbor cool. here in Laguna Woods. They have kilns here, and they, he mm -hmm. makes all kinds of amazing things. I'm right. really truly amazed at the yeah. art that goes into that. Yeah, they do have electric kilns, which are you know kind of. You know, they're, they're, you can have those in your garage yeah. and whatnot. I was so going to ask, how do you know when the temperature is right? You know, that's really interesting. There, you can have a, um, you know, kind of a thermometer in there, and it'll tell you the temperature. Uh -huh. But the other thing you use to make absolutely sure is you have a cone pack, and it's just these little cones that are made out of glaze materials that'll melt at a certain temperature. So oh. when you open up your kiln and you see how many cones are melted, you know exactly what te what temperature that cone melted at, and so you know how hot it got. Oh my oh, goodness. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> There's so much do we don't know, <laughs> isn't there? <laughs> Number three looks like it's not as functional as it is artistic. That's and what right. what are we looking at? Okay. Yeah. Well, this piece is actually three feet tall oh. and about a foot and a half wide. And it does have, it comes out, the ribs come out, the hand, that hand in particular, the fingers really come out like this. But it's a Wendigo. And the Wendigo is a creature of Ojibwe mythology. We have the Ojibwe up in the northern part of Minnesota, mm -hmm. originally from the Algonquins on the east coast, but it's okay. a cannibalistic creature. Oh my goodness. He's sort of a cautionary tale against cannibalism. And the idea was that the, um, the people were told if you cannibalized that the, you would become a Wendigo. And the thing I find interesting about this is the Wendigo is usually skeletal. It usually has sort of a, a deer head and mm -hmm. it's, it's in you know, some form of skeleton right. because no matter how much it eats, it grows. So it can never put meat on. Kind of reminded me of the American economy to be honest. Yeah. But <laughs> it, it can never put meat on because it just keeps growing and growing and it's, it's avarice, it's greed, it's... Um, would this be for sale and would it be something you'd hang on the wall yeah, if you were so inclined? Right. Yeah, there's a French cleat on the back so you can hang it on the wall. And uh -huh. these are all pottery shards um, oh. behind. So first I, I sculpt the tile and put mm -hmm. the tile down and then I put the mosaic in after the tile's done. So... Oh my goodness. Right. And so, yeah, and a number of friends when they found out that I was going to be doing a lot of mosaicing with old pottery shards. All potters have pots that didn't quite make the grade. Right. And oh. you mm -hmm. break so them up, you hammer gifts. them. So they were like, here. <laughs> so I recognize a lot of friends. Wouldn't there shards. be a museum in Minnesota somewhere that would like to have that? Well, I would love it if, if <laughs> somebody <laughs> wanted to buy it. What about galleries? Well, I do have, this was just in a show recently ah. in Minneapolis. We had a giant conference in Minneapolis. It's called Inseca. Uh -huh. And it's a clay conference that happens in a different city every year. And this year, Minneapolis was lucky oh, enough wow. to draw the card. Next year, it's in Richmond. And it happens the last week in March. And so 7,000 clay nerds, you know, potters and sculptors mm -hmm. and tile makers all c come and it's just this wonderful week of learning wow. different techniques and meeting people who you've always admired in the field. And, right. And so this was in a show for Nsika. Now, um, did it win an award? Well, th it wasn't really an award. I, I felt like the award was just getting it into that show. Yeah, it was. <laughs> so it was. I was. But yeah, so that's, this is... 
How oh, I was going to ask if there are mm -hmm. competitions. Do they award first, right. second, third? They often do. And in fact, um, the Minnesota State Fair has a fine arts competition. Ah. And I'm hoping to submit a piece to the State Fair this year. And then they do awards. They do give ribbons. So now, did, mm -hmm. did you have to submit this and then you get accepted? Do some people? Right. Right. Well, right, that's right. an honor. They have well, yeah, you juried it. shows. And so, ah. yeah. You, yeah. yeah. And in fact, it in. was, I just got it into <clears> um, the Northern Clay Center has a member show and this piece just was accepted for that well, so it'll be there thank you thank and how you. long would something like that take to, to make well when we this was for a show called cone six show and a friend of mine was promoting cone six which is a lower temperature than cone 10 which is what porcelain fires at so if you have porcelain teacup that was fired mm -hmm. to cone 10 which is mm -hmm. 2345 degrees cone six is slightly lower about 113 degrees lower but it's a significant amount and it's less energy mm -hmm. less emissions so she wanted to promote this lower firing. And so I made this with a raku clay that fires to that. So that show was in February. And um, I think the glazes are all cone six or low, low temperature. So, so would it take weeks to do that or months? Well, or? she asked me to be in the show in December. Mm -hmm. And the show opened on February 1st. And I made three pieces. This one was one of them. Oh, my. And so from, from December until February 1st, I actually finished this piece on January 31st and hung it <laughs> like 15 minutes before the show oh, opened. But God. so it was really, you know, you know the polar vortex in Minneapolis? Remember when that was happening and it was 30 below in oh, Minnesota? Oh, yes. And yes, I, I do remember. I was in my living room putting that mosaic down. <laughs> it was better to be in your With a kiln room. on real high. Well, I, had, I brought it home because I was afraid it was going to be too cold or there might be problems with getting to the studio oh, and I knew I couldn't God. miss a beat. So, yeah. I wanted so. to go to the next item. Oh, yes, um, yes. This yes. one looks functional. It's number five. It's either functional and artistic. It's a. Uh, what would you call it? It's number five. Oh, that would be the yeah my little worm pot number five. I call it well, worm W Y R M is another name for a dragon, and it's a dragon that tends to be a little bit more like a snake than like a dragon. Five and six. I wonder if you can show those if they would come up. Um, Oh, that's Amit. That's no. another tile mosaic. Oh. That's another piece I made for that Cone 6 show. Oh. And she's the Egyptian a goddess. Um, oh, that's interesting. Leader. Right. What would that be? It's a um, she crocodile head with a lion and... Hippopotamus bot bottom. And that's tied to a, a myth? Right, right. The underworld, Duat, which is the underworld of Egypt, um, has Anubis and, and um, Amit. And what happens is you die... You go down into Duat, you take a very dangerous journey to get to the Lake of Fire. You can see she's guarding oh, the Lake of Fire there. Oh, yes. And um, Anubis takes your heart and weighs it against the Feather of Justice, Ma'at's Feather of Justice. And if your heart is lighter than yeah. the feather, then you journey on. Oh. But if it is not, if your heart is heavier, you didn't live a worthy life, they feed your heart to Amit and you have a second death. And that's you're number oh. four. That's my fault. Ah, um, no worries. Four is really, mm -hmm. and that was fired the same way. There's five. Right. And then this is, this is the, wor I call it the worm because a dragon, oh, that's one yes. form of a dragon. And now is this connected to a myth also? Well, I, I happen to love dragons. And okay. I actually oh, I love like, dragons And I like too. Asia, the Asian dragon tradition is one where they're protectors, they're friends. Oh. It's the European, more the Western European tradition that the dragons are need to be they killed. They have four feet as opposed to two, I think. Yeah, yeah, I think that's true. Yes. Right. So you, do, I know my dragon. You I'm know your dragon. Yes, I'm <laughs> well, impressed, very Charlie. good. Very good. I love dragons. I yeah. want one of those little tiny dragons. You know, they, oh. they sell them. They're jeweled and mm -hmm. they're beautiful. Oh, I love dragons yeah. too. But I yeah. really like the idea of a dragon as more of a friendly protector yeah, as opposed too. to a monster that eats your cows. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I do too. But they need love too. So yes. I like those dragons yes. too. Yeah, that, uh, yeah. And number seven if it's up next. Yeah. This that's is oh, Tina. Yeah. He looks mean and nasty. What do <laughs> well, we have here? Okay, so she is um, actually a coil pot. Now, underneath all that fur is a raku clay and she is fully anatomically correct uh -huh. um, she's a baboon baboon yeah right and mm -hmm. um, the the idea behind this these are Christian Louis Vuitton shoes and they're very expensive shoes. I know they're very expensive shoes and the first time I saw a woman in one of them and a pair of them and they're black with the red bottoms and she's walking away and I'm seeing those red bottoms oh my goodness I just thought 
baboon yeah. with a red butt. <laughs> yeah, how about that? And so, those teeth, look at, look at those fangs. My, well, I didn't yeah. realize they were that long. And, and I guess when I was making the piece, I was thinking about the things we wear and how those things that yeah. we wear give people information about us and then how we react to the people reacting to us. So yeah. I think Tina is wearing the shoes and getting a reaction and maybe not as happy with the reaction as, <laughs> as she thought she'd oh. be. But she does have an extended pinky. So she's a lady. Oh, oh I don't yes. know if you can see her. It's hard to see that. Yeah, yeah. her hands. I, I only gave Put you one a shot of this. Put in her hand. And right. She but <laughs> she, so even though she's in this very compromising position, yeah. she has her pinky extended to yes. let her know that she thinks of herself as a lady. As a lady. She yeah. is a, a female in control of herself, okay. and yet and yet she's wearing the shoes, and maybe that gives a different message. Well, and tell us about what she's covered with. Okay, well, I, I had the idea that, you know, when I was making her, how would I put the texture on her? Because baboons are hairy. And I recently started spinning. Learning, oh I learned to spin. Goodness. And it's very much like throwing a pot. Really? Because because it's you know the the speed of the wheel yeah. and then you're you're doling out the the roving you know the the sheet fiber and your fingers are determining the thickness and your goal is to have you know mm -hmm. a very similar thickness as you go as you know like when you're pulling up a pot you're trying to get that wall to be nice and even so it's a very similar process very zen too there's something about oh, a spinning it, wheel yeah. that just sort of and do you have that in your home that yeah the, the yeah and I've got a little traveler I've got an Ashford traveler and so I can kind of carry it around with me I mean it's not can't take it on an airplane. I but I wonder how they did that. I yeah. would love to see that. <laughs> and spinning is actually really making quite a comeback. And is you know, I, and a lot of people learning to spin again. So I spun the fiber, the Scotland sheep fiber, and I bought three bags full mm. <laughs> because that's what you do, right? And you dyed it some color? Well, actually that was the color that's that it color? was. I did, I did um, augment it with some white and uh -huh. some black okay. um, that I, I just purchased because I wasn't sure how much to make you know I don't I don't have a recipe for that so I kind of took a shot and what at is it. eight eight is the um, the next one up is you working on this it this is my mom Nancy right. Johnson oh, yes. who is your yes. I recognize her. You recognize her <laughs> and this is in my studio and you can Conscripted see help huh? right right and, <laughs> and you can see her tail there it's getting yeah. it's getting its fiber put on and you notice the fiber you can see how it's spun Mom also combed it out after we got all oh. of her fiber on. Then see how she's combed it out oh, down yes. here. Yes. Right, right, and she's combing it out there with a with a needle tool. Oh but my But anyway, goodness. and she doesn't have her fiber on her face yet, so you get a little bit of a picture <laughs> of how she. <laughs> and do you have to glue it. those one by one? Yes, and you oh, know what no. adhesive I found worked the best. And we you cut little <laughs> short pieces and. Right, and we used Gorilla Glue. <laughs> Did you have one with a little? Oh, yeah. That yeah. You could actually paint on rather than try to squirt. Well, it was it was actually just tube? it was just a little bottle and oh. and you know when you look at your like did a, it have a brush that you could brush it? We didn't really need to. Because I just, found one that you could brush. Really? Uh, super glue. Yeah, that really makes a big difference. Well, you had a blob. you know the fiber was kind of messy too, so the goal was to kind of blob it on there, oh. you know, without the fiber coming apart. Oh my! God. But anyway, that's how we did so it. So how long did that take? Well, I. Oh. I gave myself a week before the show. The show was in July, mm -hmm. and I thought, you know, if, and I had, you have a timeline with clay. You know, you sculpt something, it has to dry, you put it into a bisque fire, then you have to glaze it, then you put it into a glaze fire, and there's this timeline. And I had given myself a, maybe a week, 10 days to do the, fi the fiber. Well, once we started working on it, Mom and I were looking at each other and we're like, no way, we're not oh. getting this done in time. So then my daughter, my son-in-law, and two of my friends came. So we had six people around Tina. Oh. Working like maniacs to get her done, and we got her done just in time. Oh. So she was on, in the show, and, on, and that was at Hopkins, Minnesota. There's a Hopkins Center for the Arts in mm -hmm. Hopkins, Minnesota. Mm -hmm. Beautiful, Did beautiful you, art facility. Did like, you spray them with you know, hairspray so they are stiff or anything? No, we didn't, <laughs> but my daughter is a barber. And so after we got Tina placed in the gallery, she sat down with her barber and gave her a, a haircut. <laughs> cleaned oh. her up. <laughs> yeah, she cleaned her up. And mom gave her the manicure. Oh. She has real nails, um, real uh -huh. um, fake nails on her, and mom gave her the manicure. Oh, my goodness. And there I am. That's, those are my shelves at Northern Clay Center. Um, and uh, a wonderful facility for anybody in the area to take advantage of and wow. take classes. And, and there's Worm. You can get an idea yeah, of how big yeah. Worm so is. So you go there and you can leave your work there, obviously, because it's a work in progress. Right. If you're taking a class, they have a place for you to leave your stuff and, uh -huh. and whatnot. I'm one of the studio artists there, so I rent a set of shelves there. Oh. Do so. you have to go overnight with some of those pieces? And I do. You have, to, yeah. I, you have a 24-hour pass if you're right. a studio artist, and I'm a night person. Mm -hmm. 
so, so I'm frequently there late. In fact, I usually am there late. Yeah. So they're, are they open 24 hours a day? Well, they're, they have regular hours for the public, but if you're a studio artist, you can kind of come oh, and go as you need, which is, works great for me. Now, do you have an office besides or a studio of your own besides? Um, well, this is my, these are my shelves at the Clay Center, and that's where I have you know kilns and, and wheels available and, and glazes and whatnot. The other the studio where we were working on um, Tina, that's in the Ivy Building. It's about half a mile from the Clay Center, and it's more of a clean studio. It's where I do my illustration. It's where oh. I have my easel. It's oh. um, you know where we worked on Tina. We put yeah, the hair on yeah. it. It's a little cleaner. We don't. Yeah. yeah I don't have a, a wheel there. Right. So what is it you have in common with Little Red Riding Hood? I'm interested. <laughs> I mean, and and the Jack and the Beanstalk and well, all those. Again, those are nursery rhymes, but yes, they, they are, are myths too. They're like myths, and they have common. You know, they sort of have common themes. And so what I, what I did a series of tiles called fairy tiles. Yes, right. I saw that right. online, yeah. And my, my idea about Jack and the Beanstalk was why was it okay for him to go up that beanstalk and rob that giant? And, you know, just because the giant was different. Yeah. He, was, he went in and took his stuff. And so it was a series of three tiles, and the first one was Jack and the Beanstalk, and the second one was Cortez coming into the New World. Ooh, like Jack saying, okay. I'm going to take your stuff. Yeah. And then the third one was a guy on Wall Street. And this was, bef you know, this was shortly after the 2008 crash. Right. Mm -hmm. But it was a, a, a man on Wall Street with his briefcase, you know, saying, so I'm going to take your stuff. So you spent some time thinking about these nursery rhymes beyond what you're right. actually... Right. How would they translate in... in and and in Ahmed is an world. example, because Ahmed, that, you know, that, that crocodile, lion, yes. hippopotamus... Right. Yes. Okay, so those were the three most dangerous animals in ancient Egypt, and they used her as the scary monster of the underworld oh. because she was a crocodile, a lion, and a hippopotamus. Right. So what would that animal be in modern day? What are our three most scary animals? And Let's see, Wall Street, <laughs> politicians. Uh, <laughs> Make an interesting animal. <laughs> oh, no, that's true. <laughs> so I like the way that certain themes translate across. I mean, we're human beings, and we all share common stories, and that's no matter right. where you're from, you'll find those common themes. And they're in nursery rhymes, and they're in myths, they're in folk tales. Now what's another fairy tale uh, that you did in, um, in the tiles? Right, I did um, the Little Red Riding Hood one, and that one was about um, predators, mm, basically. And mm. so the first one was Little Red Riding Hood with the wolf. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay, and um, the second Jack and the one, Beanstalk, was well it? that was a different set, oh, that, okay. that was a different series. Um, it was. Little Red Riding Hood was the ancient folktale it was based on. Cinderella? And then the second one was, um, I don't know, I'm trying to remember what the second one was, but the third one was Toddlers and Tiaras. Oh, about oh. predators, right. The, oh, the second one was um, an archbishop, a Catholic archbishop and a little altar boy um, because of that predatorial situation. Yeah, yeah. And then the third one was Toddlers and Tiaras, and it was a little girl all dressed up like mm -hmm. a, you know, like a yeah. beauty queen, and then this MC kind of bending over her with a microphone. Oh. So the way I was thinking about it was um, modern, modern day predators on, on children. Mm. And, then, so. and then Cinderella. Did and then the Cinderella one, yeah. And Cinderella was sitting at her hearth with her, um, she had the little mice and, yeah. and her broom and, and whatnot. And then the, um, the modern day translation to that one was um, a single mom. And she oh. has her minivan instead of a pumpkin and right. she has her child because she's a single mom. Right. She has her cell phone instead of the broom. Oh yeah. But a single mom, someone trying to you know, make their way. The middle yeah. one was Anne Boleyn. And, oh. and, um, ah. and her daughter, and with King Henry VIII in the back. Mm -hmm. ah. Again, a woman trying to make her way in a world of yeah. power. Yeah. Um, uh, and these are th that you can hang on the wall? Right. There's a series of them? They were just so series of illustrated tiles. So someone would buy the tiles. whole series if right. you were for and sale. And you know what, and I don't, I mean, those were my interpretations, but when someone else looks at them, There's I had one person come up to me, and he thought that it was Don, the, the um, Cortez, yeah. which I saw was Cortez invading the New World, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, for its spoils. He saw it as Don Quixote, and he loved so, it. He had a oh. whole different take on it. So oh. I, that's art is really great when people can bring their yes. own what filters it, yes. and, and see things interpretations their own eyes. and and right. Yeah. Absolutely, that's when it's most powerful. I think is when people can look at it and see. Well, now, do you have to? I know writing and, and authors, we have to 
uh, promote our own work often. So now, how, how does that work it, w with your work? Do you have to spend time promoting it also? You know, that is, that is such a good question, Judy, because if you're a maker, you could spend 24-7 making. Yes. But you can't. You have to run a business, too, and promotion is a big piece of that. Oh then the business of art is... And we just love that, don't we, yeah. as artists yeah. and, and writers? Yeah. <laughs> you you yeah. have to spend time on that, and my website is never updated enough, and... Oh. Um, and let's mention your, your website is dawnmalcolm.com. Not D DJ? I'm not DJ. <laughs> not DJ. What's that about? Well, actually, somebody created the website for me. And oh, okay. I had, you know, originally when I had thought of DJM, because, mm -hmm. you know, Don Johnson Malcolm. Yeah. But, um, but they created it for me, and they said, you're so lucky. DawnMalcolm.com was available. So oh, I was so like, you got to yeah. grab it if right? your whole name yeah. is available. So, Absolutely. So she, yeah, and she said, I know you go by, I go by DJ Malcolm, mm -hmm. um, but... She said, it's good if people, you know, they see you someplace and they remember you're Don Malcolm if they can find you. If, if sure. you know, they might not remember a DJ if they called me Don. Right. So again, right. another tricky thing to think about. Mm -hmm. I don't think about those things very well. So I usually rely on the help of other people. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, right, wow. It'd be but, nice if we could all hire a marketing expert, oh, public yeah. relations people, right? right? let them do it. Let them do that so you yeah. can just make, I you know? know. But yeah. if I'm gonna get on a website and start messing around, it's gonna be a whole day gone. So, oh, yeah. And it's not and, my preference. And do you have your work in, in stores nearby, and, and like, the, like the dog dish and the mugs? Right. And well, recently for Inseca, the dog dishes were in a show called um, Heroines, Hops, and Hounds. And it was at a brew pub near the convention center oh, in Minneapolis great. called Lakes and Legends. It's a wonderful brew pub. And um, so we they, had, they had beautiful windows with shelves, and we and I belong to an organization called Minnesota Women's Ceramics Association, and they had a show there with functional wear, mugs, growlers, you know, beer steins, and I and it's a dog friendly pub. You can bring oh, your dogs I love in. That. Mm -hmm. So I said, can I make dog dishes for it? Gee, and we're going to have to close soon. We didn't know. talk about her writing, and here she is, the cheese man cometh. Is that oh. <laughs> That was a, a graphic novel. That was a graphic novel my mom and I did for my brother's 50th birthday. And it was, yeah, it was a graphic novel basically kind of recounting our childhood. Oh, and I would have wonderful. loved to have seen that. Yeah, yeah. that was fun. And the other yeah, thing fun. you mentioned here is the... Uh, Liana's Dream, is that it? Oh, right, yeah. I, I did a short story for Bruce Colville. Bruce Colville is a oh, wonderful he's a well children's author. He's a fabulous man, oh and he's a God. wonderful author. And I went he's to written over 100 books, children's oh. books. He's and if you haven't read any of his children's how'd books. How'd you get him to do an edit for it? <laughs> we'll have to close, Judy. Yeah. <laughs> Answer that if you can. Okay, well, what happened was I went to a workshop, and he at the end of the workshop, he said, I'm going to be publishing a series of books, and one of them is called Half Human. And mm -hmm. if you here's my home address. Send me oh. uh, you know, your short Oh. story and so I sent him a mermaid story that I had written for my daughter's birthday and he sent it back and said I love it but mm -hmm. it needs work and over the next two years we worked on it and it was published in a, a book called Half Human oh. which is a wonderful anthology of creatures that are half yeah. human. It's like writers conferences you can wrap it up yeah. now mm -hmm. because yeah. we need to go but yeah we do do you have any words of wisdom? Well, I don't know that I have time what do you have? Uh, well I have a, a quote by the author Patrick uh, Ness folk tales and myths They've lasted for a reason. We tell them over and over because we keep finding truths in them and we keep finding life in them. I thought that related to what we've done. Does. Oh, Perfect. Thank we you. Have Don't forget the Writers Club, second Friday, three o'clock, Performing Arts Center, Dining Room One. Thanks for watching. I'm Judy Thank Saxon. You, Dawn. <laughs> I'm Charlie Redner. See you next time. Thanks, Dawn. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Thanks. We ran out of time again. You